Hello. You having a great time? It's good. Uh, my name is uh, Eirik Jorten. I'm the principal of Revheim Secondary School here in Stavanger. And uh, with me, I have brought uh, Jon Arne, who is one of my teachers, and also our gaming specialist. In the back, we have uh, two of our great students. They will join us at the stage in a short time. Vegar and uh, Eirik. Uh, we are here and very happy to be able to share some of our thoughts about games and learning and uh, our three-stage game and learning rocket. Um, it all started one and a half year ago. I got uh, up a bit early. So I had time to go through the Facebook news feed before I had to go to work. And um, I noticed a post by a Danish professor searching for partners for an Erasmus project. Uh, the project was named Flip2G, and its purpose was to look into ways of merging flipped classroom, problem-based learning, and game-based learning into a new method of teaching. And I find this, found it very interesting, and uh, almost without thinking, I sent an email telling, this is Revheim, I am the principal, and we want to join. Um, after a lot of paperwork, EU projects are a lot of paperwork, uh, and help from uh, the smart city people in the municipality, we were accepted as uh, one of the partners, and this became our first stage of our games and, and learning rocket. Almost at the same time, I was contacted by uh, Flemming Sørensen, who at that time was the leader of Stavanger Cheersport, uh, a local sports team. And he had an idea of combining traditional sports with uh, uh, eSport. And we talked together and quickly realized this would be a win-win project for both the sports team and the school. And we decided to, do, to apply for funding from Jens Stiftelsen. This became our second stage because the application was accepted and the creation of a state-of-the-art gaming room could begin. It took a lot of work, a lot of voluntary work from Stavanger Chessport, help from Atea, Lenovo, Complet, and uh, the IT department of Stavanger Municipality to get it up running. But in August, we became operational. The third stage of our rocket was the forming of Ein Harjar, a unique esports team and it's organized much like a traditional sports team. And it combines in a unique way both traditional sports and esports. And over the last months, it's become very popular among students all over the city and have become a great alternative for all of those, all of us, who doesn't think soccer gives meaning to life. So, where are we going with all this? <clears throat> we don't know. But NASA was able to send a man to the moon in a three-stage rocket, and we have built our three-stage game and learning rocket. Games and learning might not be the final frontier, but it is a new frontier, and we are going to explore it. Through research, through classroom practice, and through eSports. The sky has no limit. So, Yonana is now going to give us a brief uh, presentation of our, so, over some of our thoughts about games uh, and learning. Where's my one? There it is. <laughs> right. So, my name is John, and I'm here to tell you a bit about using video games in the classroom. Before I go off, I would very much like to encourage you all and invite you all to join me in your lunch break in around 15 minutes. At 12 o'clock in the other expo, we're launching a bit of this rocket. I want you all to be there to see what this municipality is working 
to do with gaming and esports. Now, with that said, I'm going to start. So, when I tell people what I do for a living, I get a lot of questions, and mainly, why? Why on earth would you use video games in education? And I give them two things to talk or to think about. One of them being, video games are a cultural artifact. Now, not all of you may agree with me. Luckily, statistics does. <laughs> so, 96% of boys and 63% of girls in Norway, from ages 9 to 18, play video games, and that's a fact. Now, cultural, art uh, cultural artifacts are important to learn about. So we learn about literature, we learn about movies, because they are important in our culture. But in school, we do not learn about video games. And that's what I tell them. Why not? Today, Hollywood spends a lot of money on producing movies, and we use them, because they're a great addition to our education. But the video game industry is even bigger than Hollywood. So why don't we use what they produce in our classes? And the other thing is, well, it's not exactly a new phenomenon, is it? We've used games since the beginning of time to entertain ourselves, but more importantly, to educate ourselves, to train ourselves and boggle our minds a bit. What we're doing now is not unlike that. We're simply updating to the newest version of it. So when you use video games in education, it's important to think about two things. That is something you learn about, and it's something you learn with. Those two can be mutually exclusive, but they can also be the same thing. I talked a bit about the cultural artifact of it. That's why you have to learn about it. So I want my students or my pupils to read Henrik Ibsen, to read Knut Hamsen, and to learn to analyze and criticize what they read. But I also want them to play video games and analyze them and criticize them in the same way they do other literary artifacts. That's why you have to learn about it. And if you're not in school, then where else, right? And then there's the tool part. Video games are perfect for learning, if you use them correctly. And, well, they are inherently good at teaching you to play the video game, right? Or else they wouldn't really sell, because no one could play it. Now, if you manage to include some of your curriculum into that, then you're all set. Because the game will teach you how to actually play the game, but a lot of those mechanics that you learn are useful for other situations, like teamwork, how to build large things. I don't know if you, no don't know if you noticed, but my pupils are playing Frostpunk in this screen. And what they're doing is micro micromanaging a small settlement in the frozen barren wasteland, where there's 20 minus Celsius, and they have 80 people to take care of, 50 of them are homeless, two of them are sick, and they have to manage their discontent, their hope, they have to research new things, build new buildings, recite new laws, all of this at the same time. It's a very difficult game. Like, you say that something is easy peasy, lemon squeezy. This game is the opposite. This is difficult, difficult, lemon, difficult. <laughs> and yet they play this for fun. Why? Because it engages them. And that's why we should use it as a tool, because it really engages the player. Now, a film has audiovisual impact, right? When you watch it, you get feedback from it. It's output, right? But what's different with games is that you also have the tactile input. If you watch a movie, you snooze off. The movie continues without you. If you snooze off in a video game, nothing happens. You have to be there. You have to take charge and do things inside the video game. And unless you do that, well, you don't do anything. So they experience the things that they are doing. And that, in turn, enables them to talk about it in a much more colorful way than they normally would. So a glimpse into what we've done at Revheim. And, well, I like this game. I played it some. And my job as a gaming pedagogue is finding games that are good and have something to add to that, some value in themselves, but something, some value that I can add. Now, I told you that you need to, well, add what they need to learn. Not all games can teach you well, social studies and stuff like that, unless you 
do what you're supposed to do as a teacher and show them the potential. So I had a look at, well, the core elements for the new curriculum plan in Norway in 2020. So this is for social sciences. And I'm not going to go through any, every one of them, but I'm going to show you the correlation between what they can, at some level, experience in-game that coincide with the plan. And it's quite a lot. I use this as an interdisciplinary project in English and social sciences. That means that I could use it both in English to let them play the game, because it's full of difficult words in English, and I also could make them speak English while we were playing. Since it was in English, it makes it a bit easier. But also because it gives me more time. So it enabled me to use Frostbank for in-depth learning. Instead of having one class where they play the game, I, this enabled me to have many classes where we play the game and looked at it at different levels. And that's what gaming is all about. And coincidentally, that's what the new curriculum plan is all about, using the time you're given to go in depth and learn a lot of things. Not one thing, many things. But let's not take it from just me. I have some kids there with me who are more than happy to share what they've learned. I'd like to welcome to the stage Vegar and Eirik. Different way of learning. The beauty of games and really good games is that you get meaningful choices that impact the story. In this game, we had to make difficult choices, like should we pass a law that allowed for child labor or should we build a child shelter? Had we chosen labor, we might have gotten more resources, but perhaps someone would have died. Instead of reading in a book and working with tasks, we got to see how dictatorship can be firsthand. We wrote a timeline while we were playing, which we used to do tasks afterward. The, like what type of government the game had and how this compared to Norway today. Perspective taking. We couldn't play this game as ourselves. Sometimes choices had to be made that we would never have made right here and now today. It forced us no. to think in no, ways no. we wouldn't imagine. <laughs> really role-played as someone who wanted to do their best for a settlement. But we soon ended up as more of a mix between that and someone who wouldn't do anything to survive. Research, management, democracy and ethics. We learned a lot during these hours with everything from how to build a settlement that was then the test of hardships and the elements. To what is right and wrong and how there's often a grey area especially in a crisis situation. And let's not forget democracy. It's one thing to talk about it and seeing it here in Norway. But after this game, I'm really glad we live in Norway and not in some frozen wasteland under a dictatorship. Well done, everyone, and especially you two. You were playing the game in the background, weren't you? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Cool. Do you think a project like this will change the way you go to school? Yeah, yeah, yeah it will be more interesting and fun, and uh, the pupils will be more like motivated. And yeah. Yeah, yeah they want to work. I think they it's want fun. to work. Yes. They actually want to work <laughs> in school. Uh, you learn better. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. And I know you said something about it in your amazing presentation, but could you repeat, at least for me, what did you get out of this project? What did you learn? We learned about dictatorship and... So being a dictator? Or yeah. Yes. And, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, doing the right choices and thinking as a team. Mm -hmm. It was a lot about teamwork and communication and to do the best to the people and think ethics. What were you building just before? There. Yeah? Yeah, we were uh, starting off uh, the settlement with some tents, a cookhouse, and a hunter's earth and a workshop. Mm -hmm. 
and we got resources. Yeah. Then. Lots of. Yeah. And a child shelter. A child so shelter. You, you think to protect the children. Yes. Okay. Yes. The cold and yeah environment. And you see here it's twenty oh, yeah. minus. Okay. Uh -huh. Rather cold. Good to have a shelter. Yeah. <laughs> well done, guys. John Arne, do you have a minute? Yeah, sure. Just wanted to know from your perspective, how did the parents respond to this? Maybe they would have thought that, hey, I thought they were going to, to school and to learn something. Now you're giving them video games. How did they res respond to this? Well, well, we had a, a parent conference meeting, but none of them seemed to be troubled with the fact that they were going to play games. Okay. But that's because I gave them a presentation that well, we're going to use video games, but not like they do at home where they sit and play for hours and hours without any target. I give them a task to do, and I give them a, play, uh, a game to play, and those two can go with each other. So they play a bit, they write a bit. Like Eric said, they wrote a timeline while they were playing, and afterwards that timeline can be used to go through discussions and questions that they're given after that. So they can look at, ah, oh, what we did, what we did in Day two was build a child shelter. That affected the entire population because while well, they weren't really discontent mm. about having their children freeze out to death or being in man manual labor at, their child at the age of 12, 12. So I think they understood, at least the parents in my class, that this is the future and it's not waiting for them. It's not waiting for us. We have to adapt. I think you're right, but was there an, an, an extra task to be aware of, you working as a pedagogue, kind of explaining this change in culture to the parents, you think? Yeah, but not only the parents, but the children themselves or the mm. pupils themselves, they need to be aware that when they come to play video games in school, it's not the same as playing video games at home. Okay. So that was the biggest challenge, although I would say that my class did excellent at it. They were all lined up outside the gaming room and neat little lines, two and two, and they would That's the order you want to see, yes, yeah. <laughs> perfect. It was perfect that yeah. way. Well done, guys. Thank you very much. Yeah.